Um, he's the managing director at Quarterfall, and he runs his YouTube channel, Arden Codes. And he will talk to us about how design principles help you write be better Python code. So welcome. Thank you, uh, Isadora. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you've been enjoying the tech summit so far. Uh, it's really nice to be able to talk here for a few minutes uh, with you. Uh, so my background is uh, in part from uh, computer science education. I spent about 20 years teaching all kinds of computer science subjects, from uh, programming to uh, all kinds of uh, software engineering topics. And um, the reason uh, I, I wanted to talk about software design today with you is that I think it makes a huge difference in uh, how you can progress through your career. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to also show some code just to prepare you mentally a bit for that, um, uh, to, to give you a bit of an idea of, of what I'm talking about. Um, but if you're writing simple scripts, let's say in a language like Python, um, then software design can really help you uh, structure your code a bit more. Um, often when people think about software design, they immediately think of, let's say, huge uh, ICT projects that cost millions of euros. Um, and then, of course, those projects fail. Uh, the, the Dutch government, by the way, is very good at that. Um, but even the, the, the ideas from, from software design, you can apply them to even simpler scripts. And by thinking about software design, by knowing a few of those principles behind software design, it can really help you take your basic script to a more complex script while it's still uh, manageable and, uh, and easy to change. And that's, that's the whole idea. And um, lots of uh, people in the software industry have written about software design. Uh, there are quite a few famous people. Um, uh, like uh, Robert Martin, for example, is a very well-known name. And they've all defined these principles as sets of guidelines that, that can help you um, uh, and, and think a, a bit differently about structuring your code. And I want to talk about two principles today. There are more principles. I, I run a YouTube channel where I talk weekly about these things. It's at uh, youtube.com slash codes. You can find the link uh, in the bottom. Um, but two that I want to talk about that I think are really the, the most important are uh, the, uh, the principles of cohesion and coupling. Now, cohesion is about uh, how many different things do you do in one piece of code. Uh, if you make an example with, uh, let's say, uh, the food industry, then a supermarket has very low cohesion. It does many different things. You can buy all kinds of different foods. Whereas, let's say, a cheese shop uh, has a very uh, high cohesion. It does only one thing. Uh, cheese. So if you want something else, well, you have to go somewhere else. But it does that one thing really well. And that concept, you can also apply it to writing software. So instead of having, let's say, a class or function that is 2,000 lines of code and does all kinds of different things, you can also try to split things up more. And the advantage of splitting up things is that those pieces, those bits that you create, they're easier to reuse and easier to change because they're much easier to understand. That's basically what cohesion is about. And then the other thing, that's coupling, and that's more about how dependent are different pieces of code on each other. So if you change something in one piece of code, do you also need to update 10 different files after that in order to accommodate those changes? If you have a piece of software with high coupling, then that's problematic. Because every time you make one little change, you have to change things everywhere around in your code. If you have low coupling, it means you can basically treat your application as separate pieces that do communicate in some way. But those pieces, you can modify them without affecting the rest of the code too much. So those two things, they're really important in creating applications that are more complicated. And they can already help you even if you write a smaller script, because even if you, let's say you're doing some kind of uh, machine learning project and you're writing a Python script, uh, even if you already split out things a bit more and think a bit about the design of how you set things up, uh, it's going to be easier to understand. 
for you, for your colleagues, if you want to share it. And uh, your code is basically going to be uh, easier for you to maintain also afterwards. So developing that skill can really help you work faster, which is, of course, great news if you're trying to, uh, to develop yourself in a, uh, in a tech career. So what I want to do is I want to show you a few examples of how this works. So I'm going to switch to my code editor. I made the font really large, so I hope uh, you can actually see this. Uh, what I did here is here I have a simple script that I wrote myself. And um, what it does, I'll, I'll, I'll just show you very quickly what it does. There, there is basically a player class. So this is like a small game. So a player has a name. Uh, strength, dexterity, intelligence, a couple of other traits. Basically, a player has a current health level, experience level. A player might have an inventory of items that a player collects. You can expand this class more if you want to. And then there is a very simple main function. So this is all in Python that creates a player, Geralt, and that assigns a few of these traits to that player. And for that, I'm using a little trick. This is a nice uh, function, actually, that uh, allows you to distribute traits over a total. So uh, uh, it's, this is often the case for game characters. If you uh, want to have, let's say, you have a total number of um, um, you have a total uh, number of, of points, let's say 100 points, right? And um, you want, uh, you want to distribute it so that the total is 100, but uh, it can't surpass it. So let's say a character that has a very high strength, uh, well, probably uh, doesn't have a lot of intelligence. Well, I, I'm a bit uh, uh, thinking in stereotypes now, but, but you get the idea. Uh, but here, actually, the point is that if you look at the player class in terms of uh, cohesion, there's actually co lots of things here in the player class. And that can be problematic because it means that if we want to do something else now, let's say we want to have a game enemy class, uh, well, uh, we're going to have to copy over a lot of this code if we want that enemy also to have a strength and a wisdom and charisma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what you can do in order to solve this is basically try to increase the cohesion by separating things a bit more. So, for example, uh, what you can do here is not have one huge player class, but instead you could create, let's say, a class called, oh, I have to put like this class called character traits, right? And then character traits, that's going to have basically anything that's related to the trait of a particular character. So I'm moving this from the player class to the character traits class, and I can give them like uh, default values like so in Python. Uh, let's just do that quickly. <clears throat> now, instead of player having all of these things separately inside its own class, we can add here something called traits, and that's character traits. And then we need to initialize this in some way. I'll, uh, I'll come back to that later. So because we did the split here, because player now has traits, it means it's now also very easy to, let's say, um, uh, create a class enemy. And an enemy can also have traits. And we don't have to copy over all these implementation details anymore. And that's a big advantage of using um, uh, code that has a high cohesion, where things are well separated. And uh, in order to uh, complete this example, so uh, what you can do, you also need to initialize the traits somewhere. So we could add a function here. Let's say we want to do it randomly. So we have roll traits, and that's going to give us character traits. And uh, what that will do is return a character traits object, and that gets the data that we had here in the beginning of the example. So I'll just move that over here, like so. And then I can put this function in the player class, like so. So now we have another. Now we have an example where the traits are separated from from the player, and that makes the code a lot easier to manage. So that's one example that I wanted to show you. That's about cohesion. 
Another example I have is about coupling. So I'll just uh, close this. There we go. So coupling means that things are uh, more or less dependent on each other. And this is also a very important aspect of software design where uh, you need to make sure that if you do separate your code in various ways by you know, lowering cohesion and trying to separate things better, then it's also important to make sure that those things can actually be changed independently. Now, if you look at this particular example, this is a, uh, I'll just scroll down a bit. Uh, this is an example where uh, we have a function that creates an order. So you can imagine this is like a web shop and then there is a payment method that's being selected. Then there is an authorization method like, uh, you know, um, uh, Google Authenticator or uh, authorization via SMS. And then the payment processor pays that particular order and then the clients can pay the order. That's the whole idea. And uh, let me run this just to show you what, what's uh, happening here. So if you run this, basically you enter how you would like to pay this order. So let's say I, I enter credit card and then I choose an authentication method like Google. And then I'm getting an authorization code. Normally, of course, that this would be on your phone. This is just a mock-up of how it could work. So I provide the code and then it's processing the credit payment for that particular amount. So very simple. And I can run it again. And then I can choose something else like uh, PayPal and uh, I can do SMS and then I put in the SMS code and it also processes the payment. Now, the way that the code is set up is if I scroll up, is you see that we have a function for creating an order and adding a few items to the order. Then we have a function for reading the authorizer that you want. So do you want Google or SMS? And we also have a function that reads how you would like to pay, credit, debit, and PayPal. Now, these two functions right here are very good examples of highly coupled code um, uh, because as you can see, when you read the choice, uh, this function needs to know about credit, debit, and PayPal payment processors. And you also see that here, it returns an object, credit payment, debit payment, PayPal processor. And the same thing for the authorization. So depending on the, the choice you make here, uh, you return a different function in this case. So that means if you want to change this code, it's actually pretty hard because, well, uh, you have to put it in here. If you want to add, let's say, another payment, let's say you want to add Stripe. So you need to add another else here to this if statement to return a Stripe payment processor. You have to not forget to put it in here. Uh, so it's kind of cumbersome. And that's what coupling means. It means that a function like this or a class is highly dependent on implementation details. And because of that, it's harder to change. So another way to do it is instead of having this very complicated if else statement, you can use uh, other mechanisms to try to separate this a bit more. And here I made an example. I, I won't uh, code this one out because that's I think that's going to take a bit too much time. But here I did it slightly differently where uh, basically at the top of the file, so it's, it's actually a minor change. At the top of the file, I have a constant that maps a name to a particular payment processor. So this is a Python dictionary. And in the function that reads the payment choice, I use that dictionary to get the information that I need. So how would you like to pay? And the options that I provide, well, those are the keys of that dictionary. So that's going to give me credit, debit, and PayPal. And the same thing, let me scroll back up, the same thing for, um, for the authorizer. So instead of having an if else statement going through all the options. No, I just use the information that I have in my dictionary. And now if I want to change one thing in my code, I can basically go up here and I can add the information here. So if I want to add Stripe, I add here another line called, let's say Stripe and then Stripe payment processor. And then because these functions read payment choice is not directly coupled anymore to specific payment processors, I don't need to change this anymore. And that means maintaining the code is going to be a bit easier. Now, this is a pretty basic example. Obviously, uh, the more complex your code becomes, uh, the, let's say the, the, the more important it becomes to do these things uh, because the impact is going to be bigger. And every time you add complexity to your code, if you 
keep on doing this, if you keep being aware of, uh, of dealing with uh, coupling and cohesion in this way, this is going to help you keep your code relatively simple, um, which in the end is going to help you um, write code faster. Uh, so this is, the, this is what I want to share with you today. Um, there's of course many other design principles, cohesion and coupling, they're just two of them. Uh, I cover a lot of them on my YouTube channel. I put out a video there every week. So if you want to uh, watch those videos, uh, the link is down below. Uh, what I also have is a free design guide. So if you want to learn a bit more about the steps I take to design a new piece of software from scratch and what you need to think about, uh, if you go to this link, you can put in your email address and you'll get this design guide from me uh, by email. So. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you must also be uh, uh, anxious to get into the networking event, so I won't take up any more of your time. If you have any question, uh, feel free to let me know. Hi. <laughs> um, there is one question. Um, it's just coming up here right now. Thank you so much for your talk. It was great. Um, let me just... Um, wait for the question. So, hey Arjun, big fa fan of your channel. Do you have any general tips for improving one's rec recognition of, of where design patterns can be useful to increase cohesion and reduce coupling, or does it mostly come down to developing a practice eye? Uh, thanks, Jordan. That's actually a very good question. Um, a big part of this is, um, is let's say, code diagnosis. So you have to make sure you understand the problem in the code uh, before you start modifying things. Um, there are uh, lists of these things, of things that you can watch out for. They're called code smells. Uh, I did a couple of videos mm -hmm. about that also on the channel. But uh, let's say there is a, a few examples of code smells of, let's say, uh, issues in the code that you can recognize are things like if you have a very long function right? That probably means that uh, you put way too many lines of code in that function and it's trying to do too many things. Um, another example of uh, something that can, can help you identify a problem in the code um, um, is if you have very complicated if-else uh, logic. So if this, uh, then that, else that, etc., and highly nested code like that, that also often points to uh, um, uh, an issue with, with the complexity of, of the logic. And you can probably separate out things a bit more and make them a bit simpler. Uh, and there are other things uh, as well. For example, if you want to look more at, at uh, issues with coupling, um, if, for example, you have a function that calls an object that has another object that you call that you then call a function on that object again that you do something else with. So you get this whole chain of things. That's also an example of where you probably have a dealing, where you probably have, have an issue with coupling, because then every part in that chain where there's a potential change, it means you're going to have to update your function. So those are some examples of uh, things that you can uh, look at. And of course, as you said, you, it, it is practice. Uh, you st uh, if you do um, uh, more development, you, you learn those things, you see them more quickly. Uh, doing code reviews of other people's code can actually help you also uh, in, in understanding that. Um, we also have another question um, from John. Do you think inher inheritance is a good way to apply cohesion or do you advise caution with it? Yeah, inheritance, that's uh, on the one part, it's, it can be dangerous uh, because actually what happens with inheritance, if you have a class and you create a subclass of that class that does something else, you're actually adding complexity. You're not simplifying things. And that's why if you look at uh, the classic uh, software design books like the Design Patterns book, uh, is that inheritance is used very carefully. It's mainly used uh, to define an interface between things. So you have your super class that can be abstract or in some languages even support an interface like C Sharp that defines what some kind of object exposes to you and then you use that and then if you rely on the interface and not directly on the object you reduce coupling so um, inheritance 
and especially if you use it carefully, is very good for reducing coupling. Um, in general, inheritance leads to uh, lower cohesion because you're adding complexity to a class instead of simplifying it. Thank you so much for answering your questions and thank you for talking to us as well. Um, it was great having you.